Hello, welcome to To The Point. I'm Shashi Tharoor. And today, we are in the campus of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, a part of the Indian Space Research Organization. And I'm talking to its director, Dr. S. Somnath. Very good to be with you, Dr. Somnath, in this splendid setting. This is the museum of the VSSC. And I think we should probably start with the story of this museum itself, because you have established it inside a church. What's the story behind that? Thank you. Thank you for starting this conversation from this museum. You know, this is a very, very important place for us. This is where the rocket activities in India started. Uh, when Vikrasarabhai located Tumba as the place to start the space program. Uh, this story is very well known. I think I don't have to repeat that. Oh, you so, should. <laughs> Maybe the viewers who don't know oh, it. Fine. The, uh, so, he, he located Tumba. Then this coastal area is, uh, is a habitat of a lot of you know, people who go for fishing and they had a church here and uh, Sarabhai came and met the priest at that time, uh, Bernard Pereira, and then talked to him why this place is so important for the space research activities because it passes very close to the magnetic equator of Earth. Then he came here, it, it's a story says that he came and met when the congregation was going on, uh, he met the church priest and then told him that uh, this place has to be given to for space research and the all those who assembled there were they were clapping and agreeing to it. Later, this land was acquired by the government, handed over to Istro. The place where we sit today is the place where the initial rockets were you know, assembled, built, research was conducted. Uh, even the Nekke Apache rocket, which came from US, French, and Russian collaboration, was assembled here. And just a few hundred meters from here, it was you know, launched. Uh, the sea coast is very nearby. That's right. It's a great story of how an entire community of Latin Catholic fisher people got together and donated their church and the lands around it to the cause of space research in India. True, true. So, we, so. Must, uh, we must say you know, hats off to those two great men, Sarabhai and uh, Bishop Pereira. That's right. And, 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 and here today, what we are sitting in is a complex which is going down history in all sorts of ways, but it's also been the nerve center of where so many exciting adventures uh, have been have been launched, literally launched into 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 space. I'd like to start with your own story. You're a, a young boy growing up in the in the rather pretty coastal town of Alapuja in Kerala. What made you think of space? Why space? Uh, when I was a young boy uh, in school times, uh, we were very fascinated. Like any other child of that age, you know, they will be very much fascinated by the sun, the moons, the stars, and my father was a, a science enthusiast, though he was a teacher of Hindi <laughs> language, but he, somehow he was so interested in science. He used to bring me books, uh, especially in astronomy and also some books in English at that time because I was learning, my schooling was in vernacular language and not in English, Malayalam. in Malayalam. So I couldn't read many of those books at that point of time. But he was talking about science and he was bringing some science uh, book in Malayalam. I was reading that. So the schooling time was very interesting. But later when I went into engineering, uh, engineering was an option, was not very an easy option at that point of time. But due to many circumstances, I went into engineering. But there I really developed the, the fascination for space uh, research and space science, etc. Uh, in fact, there is no specialization possible. There is no specialization. I was a mechanical engineer mm. uh, when I graduated, but during course itself, I was interested in propulsion. I went and asked my professor, why can't you take a course on propulsion, which was not offered in the college. Then he said, yes, I will study and, and teach you. Mm -hmm. So, I ten of us joined together to take that course very first time in my college. And I also remember when we were all recruited for this space program, it was a time when PSLV project was just starting. And that's the polar Satellite. satellite launch vehicle. Right. There was uh, now quite a bit of intake of engineers into this and we all applied. While we were in college, uh, I was only in the final year uh, and they were recruiting people in the final year with the based on the marks in the previous uh, you know, semesters or whatever. Five of us were selected, so I happened to be one of them. Really? So, it was it was because of a passion and interest which was you know, within me that you know, ultimately made reach here. Excellent. So, you started off in the PSLB program. What was the main accomplishment of the PSLV? The PSLV was a game changer in the history of Indian space program. Probably you are aware of the SLV3 story where Kalam was the... Uh, Dr. Abdul, Dr. Abdul Kalam, Kalam was the... Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was the project director. 
Then we had another program called ASLV, not very much talked about, but mm -hmm. still it was a technology developer for the next generation of rocket. So when the PSLV was conceived as an operational rocket, SLV-3 was not an operational rocket, it was only a study rocket. Mm. But the PSLV was destined to launch our future remote sensing programs, to meet the future remote sensing program, which was met by only the Russian launches at that time, the IRS series of satellites. And remote sensing is used for monitoring climate and yes. all sorts of... So we, we our passage. target was to put a 1000 kilogram satellite at 1000 kilometer orbit. Mm. Huh? So that, that was achieved by the PSLV. So that's the significance for an operational satellite to be put in orbit. So we were making the rocket very first time. And I will tell you a few more very interesting aspects of PSLE. That's the first time that we used liquid propulsion, mm -hmm. using liquid propellants and then solid propellants in tandem in a rocket. And this is the first time Indian Space Research Program went into a large scale industrial support for the, our space program. So the entire PSLE was, while we were designing, it was produced only in industry. So large scale. No. So no imported parts or some imported it, they, it was having a lot of imported parts at that time. I must say around 60% was only indigenous at that point of time. Mm -hmm. But today PSLE has almost reached 95% indigenous mm -hmm. content. Maybe still 5% is coming from outside, especially in the form of electronic parts, mm -hmm. chips and things like that. But the most of the materials and the elements that makes PSLE is 95% Indian. And the design was wholly Indian? Design is wholly Indian. I think many people have this notion that we have borrowed some design from somebody and made a rocket. Of course, we studied many other designs. When I was a young engineer, we used to refer to designs of NASA, your designs of European designs. We study all of them, but finally we make a design of our own, which suits our requirement. The French engine, the Viking engine, which we Arian used in there, and the Vikas engine, which we used in PSLE, were jointly developed by Indians and French people working in CNES. So it's owned by us and owned by the CNES. So okay. it's our engine. Wonderful. Now we've gone one step beyond the PSLV, yes. right? Now yes. we have the GSLV, the Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle. Yes. And you're already up at Mark III. You're right. working on or producing Mark III. Right. Again, tell us what is the evolution from polar to geosynchronous? What does it do? And and there, remember, we are all lay people, we are not yeah, scientists I'm, I'm and engineers telling, I am trying to tell it as simple as possible. Right. Uh, see, uh, when, when you look at PSLV, I told about solid and liquid propulsion. But if you have to put a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, which is far away, it is 36,000 kilometers above the surface of Earth. Wow. Whereas, uh, the uh, observer, remote sensing satellites are put only 1,000 kilometers up. So, to achieve that, you need cryogenic technology. Otherwise, you, the rocket is simply incapable of going up to transferring that much of energy. So, GSLV is nothing but PSLV in a way packaged but with a cryogenic upper stage. And GSLV Mark 3 is yet another bigger version of GSLV where the cryogenic upper stage is our indigenous upper stage. The G original GSLV which was uh, launched had a Russian collaboration in the cryogenic stage. Oh, I see. When you came to GSLV Mark 3, the entire cryogenic upper stage was our own. Now we, in fact, I was part of that project and I knew it was, it was only on a sketch on a paper mm. uh, and we could see the cryogenic stage comes to shape. So I, I can vouch you that it is, it is fully our own. Excellent. Now, <clears throat> we have some interesting news coming out of, uh, out of uh, the government, particularly in the space field in recent weeks. And I thought we might touch on two or three of them. Oh, yes. One important uh, big headline grabber is Gaganyaan, this new mission, which will well, you tell us what it will do. Uh, as declared already, and it's now it's there in public domain. The Gaganyan program is the Indian Human Space Flight Program, and it also says that we will send three Indian nationals to space uh, and then bring bring them back safely. So it it talks about only the first step of human space flight capability for Indian uh, space research, or uh, as far as the Bharat. Uh, is concerned. And that's what the GSLV Mark III will be used for? The GSLV Mark III is a rocket which will be converted to a human space flight capable rocket. So we call it human rating of the rocket. Mm. Uh, the rocket per se is very reliable, but when human beings fly on it, then you need to be extra cautious. Mm. Say the human life is at risk, you also have to look at the conditions in which the human being flies. Mm -hmm. uh, he should not feel discomfort to an extent not tolerable. While it is coming back also, it must be very safe. You must have an ability to abort the rocket in case that uh, there is an anomaly you know, growing up and then there is no chance that it will go to orbit. So there must be a computer sitting inside telling us 
yeah, there is a danger coming, why don't you abort now? So it decides itself because nobody in the ground can do any of this. So we need to create that intelligence in the rocket. There is an array of work which is required to make Gaganyan possible. And all of this is being done for the first time in India because yes. I think the Americans have done it, the Russians have done it, nobody yeah. else has. Pretty uh, much. Yes, Europeans have certain capability because they have done their own human missions in other vehicles. So are you getting any collaboration from any of these? We do have collaboration in various you know, elements. We have it with the uh, Russians very strongly because they are supporting it uh, without much difficulty. Mm -hmm. We also have dialogues with the uh, European uh, agencies with regard to training and some of the facilities. Mm -hmm. We are also discussing with the NASA and the collaborators or industries in uh, supporting NASA to supply of certain parts of the, you know, what I mentioned about environmental control and life support systems, crew seats, you know, some of the recovery, you know, logistics, because it's a global mission. Human space flight is not limited to India. While they are in orbit, they will not be on top of India all the time. They will That's be right. revolving around the globe. So we need to observe them. You have to talk to them. We need to have ground station support throughout the globe. Maybe you know, all across, virtually every ground station need to be linked to them to see whether they are in safe and country. If suppose some anomaly develops, we need to send commands to them, even when they are on top of USA. So we need that type of collaboration. Excellent. I'm told that COVID affected uh, the preparations for all of this to some sure. degree. You were planning to send an unmanned uh, Mission, yes. GSLV or something uh, way back in, no, I think it was going to be in December 2020. Last is, yeah, it yeah. wasn't. But December. it didn't happen because didn't of happen. COVID. Yes. Um, so what, what, how much is the setback? One year, less, more? I, I can't tell you where exactly. It's, definitely it is, a, it is a year plus uh, the total delay from that uh, December 2020. Even this December, it's going to be pretty tough. The real reason for this is that we do not do all the work here in this, you know, within the campus. It's actually distributed all across the country. Oh, I see. See, the work for the Gaganyan, the building of the rocket is not taking place here. Uh -huh. uh, so, some material comes from uh, Midani in Hyderabad. It goes to Roorkela. It gets rolled there. Some of the material goes to Mumbai where it is manufactured in Godrej. It has to come back to Bangalore to do some work, then it will go to Mahendragiri for some additional work. Is that the most efficient way of doing it? It is definitely not the efficient way. It would have been nice that everything is under one roof. But you must also realize that this is a part of the evolution of the whole program. Mm. See, we were looking at where there is a capability. If there is a steel plant available in Rukela, why don't we use that steel plant to roll the street? Uh, the melting takes place in Midani where it is, you know, uh, we have the plant to do that. Godrej is having the ability to manufacture. And we have the test facility in Mahindragiri. So we need to do this, you know, uh, jumbling to get things done. So if you do it everything under the sun, we need to, you know, under one, you know, uh, no, no, one roof, we need to spend quite a bit of money to create that infrastructure. Fair so it, it's really a shoestring budget mode of working in ISRO all the time. And that's something I'd like to return <laughs> after our break. We'll take a short break now and be back with Dr. S. Omnath, Director of the VSSC. Welcome back. You're watching To The Point. I'm Shashi Tharoor and I'm in conversation with Dr. S. Somnath, who is the director of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center in Tiruvananthapuram. Dr. Somnath, we were talking about something which uh, I think uh, is actually one of the special things about the Indian space effort. You said we have done things inexpensively. And I was very struck by the fact that when Mangalyaan went to Mars, uh, it had a number of amazing firsts. It was the first uh, country in the world to successfully launch right. a Mars ar orbiter That's as the right. first attempt. That's right. Yeah. All the other countries, very few countries have done it, but those who have done it had to make several attempts to do it. Yeah. And countries as sophisticated as Japan and China have not been able to do it, but yeah. India did. But what was even equally striking was that Mangalyaan, apparently, the total cost of it was 11% of the cost of NASA's space orbiter to Mars, and it was pointed out was probably less than the entire budget of the Hollywood space movie Gravity. True. So you've got an amazing ability. We've got it in India to do things inexpensively, frugal innovation. Yes. But how do we do that without cutting corners and taking risks? No, this is a, it's a matter of uh, culture of the organization, I must tell you. 
see we can do it very costly we can do it at, at a very low cost provided the the approach to the problem solution is is defined in a way uh, it will be frugal for any new design that has to come out you need to make models we say we call it engineering model then we have a proto model then we have a flight uh, simulator model then the flight model and then we also look at simulations that before we actually do something we go to computer quite a bit you you simulate the whole activity and then get the result and then look at various design options by which that number of possibilities can be narrowed down to a very very limited number so it actually reduces your investment to do the pre engineering activity mm -hmm. so that your final product can be you know, can be realized at lower investment second point is that we are all taught from the very beginning ever since i joined isro you you are going to work in an environment which is not that uh, flashy you know be remember that when you procure you buy something or do something cost is the paramount importance mm -hmm. in terms of purchases that we do in terms of the facilities that we create we if it is a costly item it is subject to rigorous you know thrashing before it is actually given okay to buy so that means the internal culture is towards uh, the frugal nature of engineering then second is we do recycle quite a bit that means if you make a proto model we always look at can i use it for some simulation work after doing a little bit tweaking can i instead of making a fresh item can i do that so the ultimately at the end of the launch what we see is we have not accumulated you know materials too much we just enough materials we made a flight stage so which is definitely not by cutting corners it is the attitude that we put forth before for the development program if you are funding me something i can tell you i need 10 models before i deliver the 11th as a flight sometimes you may fund me but we don't even go to government and tell that we don't need 10 models i will work with two and a half models and i will make the flight flight uh, of the rocket but let me be a little rude and say but could a frugal approach have partly explained the well publicized failure of the chandrayaan moon landing and the way in which the land rover crashed what what happened? absolutely not i think it has nothing to do with the approaches of engineering mm -hmm. approaches of engineering is one and and problems and issues in a mission are another see we must realize that space technology is a very unpardoning technology uh, because because it is done fully autonomously there is no intervention just the case of an aircraft uh, which you are designing assume that i am designing a transport aircraft before it actually flies with passengers it would have gone to hundreds of test in the ground first it will do the rolling then it will take a little height and then come back and land then it will go up further and then if there is an issue we will correct it in the next mission look at the rocket rocket never get a chance to do this mm. or a mission to chandrayaan or a mars will will never ever get a chance to launch it in a in a test flight and then say the landing is perfect for in the case of chandrayaan 2 we did actually simulated lot of landing exercise in earth but they were all successful mm. but the moment that we go to moon there is yet another problem that we have a low gravity compared to earth you cannot create a low gravity field in earth there are con conditions which are you know which is more near to a vacuum condition uh, on that surfaces then there is a navigation uh, which is measuring its position really er errors due to that there are also dispersions in propulsion which is beyond what you can actually simulate in ground hundreds of parameters that actually makes a real situation could be much different from what we anticipated or simulated are we going to try again we are going to try again because we understood there are parameters beyond what we actually done the simulation in ground we need to go further for that we are making lot of you know, simulation test beds we are also making sensors basically looking at where you are uh, more redundant systems new technologies which we are not put last time all this will come into the new lander and with the with the knowledge and confidence we have to go ahead we may fail again i i want to tell you that there is no guarantee of success in any rocket mission we, why is it worth doing why is it worth because it is worth doing this we are doing it see we must realize that the high tech engineering activities of this nature why human beings do it is because it is challenging hmm. and it is also because it is the only way that human beings can explore i tell my en young engineers why we do we work on rockets not because that it puts some satellite up there rockets are the only means by which human beings can ever travel the shores of the earth to another planet there is no other way right well you know internationally we've been reading about the space explorations of people like elon musk and uh, jeff bezos and all these private sector entrepreneurs and this week the government of india has announced that india too 
will open up the space sector to the private sector. Yes. Tell us how that will impact your work. First of all, do you welcome this policy decision? I welcome with all heart. How will it help you? Definitely it will help us because I told you in the PSLV story also we, I mentioned that we were making industries partners of our program. Uh, and we were not manufacturing rockets internally. We were mark making it in, 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 in Indian industry. But now it a time has come, those industries have been suppliers of Indian space program. They are making materials, they are manufacturing, they are making systems, supplying. But the whole knowledge of making rockets still resides within ISRO. It's not only in rockets, it's so for spacecraft, it's also for applications. Mm. Now, this has time, the time has come that industries have to take a higher role to do this. Then only there will be a significant change happen in terms of innovation, in terms of cost reduction, in terms of expanding the markets and then look at other, no, the whole scale of operations if you want to really expand, it will not happen in a government system. The money that comes to ISRO is all, always limited, it's just 15,000 crore. Suppose this 15,000 crore has to become a 50,000 crore enterprise, it's not possible in a government you know, setup. And government will never be in a position to give you 50,000 crores for the space program to expand. So how do we create this money? It has to be created through an industrial activity in which there is a output, there is a market, there is a profit that is coming, hence industries can get into it. So we have to first develop markets, correspondingly we will develop satellites and launch vehicles and applications. So this opening up will really change the structure of the whole space enterprise, but not change ISRO. Uh, I want to tell you that ISRO will continue to do the work which we are doing okay. because we have the fundamental duty to do research and development of new, new areas mm -hmm. where there will not be very easy, you know, uh, people, you know, it's not, not an easy path for industries to come in for the time being. Probably they may also become good researchers in the days to come, but today it has to continue. We also have to do novel missions like going to Mars. Industries may not go immediately, but they can do quite a bit of work for uh, going to Mars or human space mission, for example. That's right. In fact, I was interested, I was in Hyderabad recently, yeah. and I was given a presentation by two youngsters in their 20s who are starting a company that's going to manufacture, true, true. they claim, yeah. space exploration. Yes. So I, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the smart startup sector. And I was a bit skeptical thinking, you will look at ISRO today, and what can a couple of young chaps with a private sector company do? But you're saying this is welcome, startups are welcome. Yes, yes. No, the reason is, uh, see, we need people with great amount of enthusiasm. Those two young fellows represent the enthusiasm of the new generation. That's right. So what uh, we need to do is we have to support them. We have to help them. So ISRO recognized this point. The Department of Space recognized this point and they have created in space. When they come up, it's actually the Indian space program is coming up. But we're so secretive in our country. There are signs and perimeter guards and everything else. Are you going to be welcoming Two young kids or 20 young kids and telling them uh, they're already some there. of your secrets? They're already there. I am in touch with them. Really? Uh, I, I have been, ever since they started, incubated this program, I am talking to them. Okay. I am mentoring them. I, in fact, I have read their design documents and I commented them how to design. All right. Not really passing on the secret information I have, <laughs> which I am not allowed to, but I can give all the necessary guidance and support for startups to come up. That's fascinating. L let me just ask one more question about this whole new private sector environment we have. I read somewhere that the global space commerce business is worth $440 billion oh, yes. and that by 2030 it may be worth a trillion dollars. Yes. Startlingly of that $440 billion, India, which is after all a world leader in space or has been, only accounts for 2%. Yes. How do we, our country, get in <coughs> to the act so that by 2030 when it's a trillion dollars, we can have 10% of that and not 2%. Now, we have to understand the mathematics here in a, in a little more carefully. When you talk about 440 billion US dollars, the business, much of it is for the application domain and the services. The space-based services sector is the biggest chunk of this 440 million US mm -hmm. dollars. The space satellite side, satellites building takes about around 7% of this 440 billion US mm -hmm. dollars. The launch vehicle pro activity is only 3% of the 440 billion US dollars. So what kind of uh, services are we talking See, it, about? I thought your India launching foreign country satellites is a service. It's a service. But that, that part of the cost is actually a small part of the overall cost. So oh, where we need to focus for bringing about large scale change in the is in terms of services. For example, I'll tell you, you have telecom equipments. 
uh, to give satellite services, you need to put uh, ground equipments, you need to have the communication equipment, wireless equipments. Are they manufactured in India? No, it is coming from outside even mm. today. Even the national service provider which makes that uh, the tower or the transmission equipment is all important. Mm. That, that is one of the biggest, so ground stations is one of the important element. Downloading images, processing and supplying is an important. Once that you know, communication data comes, reaching out to the customer is another important source. So all these are the biggest money makers in this business. Uh, but the launch vehicles called the rockets or the satellites are technologically intensive. But as far as the volume of money is concerned, they are small percentage. So if you really want to really make a change, we need to focus on the, the application side of it, marketing side of it, distribution side of it. Also, don't miss the point that uh, if you have your own satellites only, you can do it efficiently. Hence, you need to build the satellites in India. Mm -hmm. And and if you can launch in, in India only, then it will be built in, built in India. Otherwise, it will go to Kuru for launch. So, they are all connected things. But if you really want to make it to 10%, we need to focus on all three domains. We need to look at launch vehicles. We need to look at satellite. We need to look big on the application and service sector. Right. Well, this is an endlessly fascinating subject. Yeah. There's a lot more to talk about, including things like uh, the rules for outer space where India should be playing a big role in writing international rules and regulations on outer space. But we are out of time. So I want to bring you back to where we began with you as a young student of uh, mechanical engineering, suddenly finding yourself recruited as a space scientist. Today, ISRO supports a university that actually teaches space studies. How well is that doing? Are you getting your recruits now who have specialized in space studies? Or is ISRO and VSSE still open to regular mechanical engineers, civil engineers and the like? Uh, today, we have uh, different modes of recruitment. Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, which I, I am the director now in charge okay. of that also. So, we have, a, uh, we have students coming there. They are all coming from the IIT, JE entrance route only they are coming. So, they okay. are the best of the students that we can get there. And we have put a certain you know, academic excellence for them to come to ISRO. So okay. once you cross that threshold of excellence, then we take them to ISRO. Till date, we have almost 1,100 of uh, the engineers uh, in ISRO currently are from Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. Wow. And we have an assurance to them that you will be considered preferentially for coming into ISRO. But that doesn't mean that we only limit it to that. It is open to public, everybody. And we conduct a national selection test every year. Uh, mostly every year and uh, typically one, 100 and almost a lakh or plus lakh people write this exam wow. and we select just 100 out of it. And of that 100, what percentage would be from the Space Institute? I know that it's it, the Space Institute recruitment is through a different process. Okay, so, that's so whereas the other recruitment process is through a public uh, examination, they can also write. So but there are 100 coming in yes. from other disciplines and how many would you take from? Uh, then we go to campuses, hmm. we go to IITs, uh, the premier NITs, then we conduct campus interviews and select some people. We also recruit PhDs if you have a domain specialization needed. And that will be uh, a separate recruitment where we constitute a committee, review the credentials of the PhD holder and then specifically recruit one or two of such uh, eminent uh, researchers. So we have different modes of recruitment. So you're growing, expanding and recruiting. It's an exciting time to be in the field of space. We've been privileged to have this conversation with Dr. S. Somnath, Director of the VSSC Tiruvananthapuram. Thank you, Dr. Somnath, for your time. Good luck with your extraordinarily exciting work. Thank you.